Hi, everybody. It's Todd Conklin, and this is the Pre-Accident Podcast number two. Today, we're going to have a great discussion with a wonderful thinker in our field. Her name's Martha Acosta, and you probably don't recognize the name, but I'll bet you a buck you recognize the work she's done. In fact, lots and lots of slides that I see all around the world are original slides that Martha developed. Lots of them. Martha was the instructional designer and one of the early developers for the Human Performance Fundamentals class within the Department of Energy. Now, Martha currently works for Harvard, and she does a lot of the leadership training and development work really worldwide. We're really lucky to get to talk to Martha. She's one of the foremothers of human performance and the new view of safety in an applied fashion here in the United States. And she's done a lot of work on this, but more importantly for us, She's done a lot of thinking about this, and Martha's going to share with us a couple ideas. In fact, this podcast is probably going to split into two podcasts because we're going to start by talking about the presence of pain in a system and why pain becomes a real important predictor for prevention of failure. Now, this podcast is really, really interesting because Martha's best talent is taking very high-level conceptual ideas and tweaking those in an applied way so that we can use them tomorrow with our leadership. Listen carefully because I think you'll find Martha's podcast to be remarkable. Enjoy. There's more of this where this came from. And without any further ado, please welcome Martha Acosta. So what's your opening question going to be for me? For you? Uh I think I'm going to probably start with, um, did you ever imagine this HPI stuff would take you the direction it took you? Oh, okay. Okay. Because I think that's that's a good one to sort of hit on. So that's good. So did you? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I don't see that. I don't know. Like, it's hard for me to talk about uh, the personal aspect. I mean, certainly the HBI stuff created a an interest in. Although that I, I that I kind of already had. Well, so how freaked out are you, how freaked out are you on the fact that you're kind of you've sort of become this one of the weird foremothers? <laughs> do, do you know this? No. Do you know that? Do you know that if you go to any meeting at all, uh-huh. anywhere in the world, it's a pretty good bet you'll see the two pie slide. <laughs> you used to see the mousetrap slide. Uh-huh. I, I mean, you still see all these. You see these. Wow. Everywhere. And these are all these little theories that you helped develop. I mean, what do you think about that? Does that freak you out? Yeah. Well, I guess it kind of does freak me out. I Certainly, it's – since then, I've certainly delved into it a lot deeper. Oh, yeah, for sure. And um, and though those underlying principles are interesting, I think that they're fundamentally simplistic. I mean, when I look back at what was groundbreaking when we were at the lab, right. it's fundamentally pretty simplistic. I, so I do the same thing. And, and and what I think is interesting is how we once thought these very simple ideas would be very profound. Uh-huh. That's kind of in a, if you made a maturation curve, it's kind of, it must be where the conversation started. The example I give you is, we really went through a period of time where we thought if we could predict all error precursors mm-hmm. and fix them, the world would be safer. Right. And what's so funny is now that just seems ridiculous. It's just like, <laughs> what, what were you thinking? You're crazy talk. Really, predict well, all error precursors. That? We, we yeah. We kind of went through that where, you know, the, the whole secret is the precursors. It's the latent conditions. If we find all those latent conditions and fix them, the world would be a better place. Right. But those latent conditions, I think the thing that I'm learning in doing research into paradox is those latent conditions will come up when they need to come up. And what we need to do is we need to prepare ourselves to be able to deal with them when they, when they do. So all of these organizational tensions, and paradox is one of them, are indicators that there's, there's some sort of problem in the system some sort of latent condition in the system or some sort of impending performance problem or the beginning of a performance problem. And and conceptually, cognitively, we 
we create them to be these conundrums, these paradoxes that are difficult for us to solve. And we can either ignore them, make fun of them, like, you, you know, uh, what was the what was the bumper sticker at the lab? Um, this is a work-free safety zone. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, or we can look at the paradox and recognize that that is a big, flashing, uh, glow-in-the-dark arrow pointing to things that we need to be looking at organizationally. So define paradox, because I think that's something that people are going to struggle with right. sort of on the outside. Well, paradox, I mean, the way that we think of paradox is, you know, the mathematical way, you know, like mathematical paradoxes or thinking about um, uh, the kind of riddles that Oedipus would have <laughs> would have solved and everything. But how you define it in kind of organizational management science is that it's a socially constructed tension uh, of contradictions that are interdependent, right? right. They need each other, right, right, right. but we can't sort of tease them apart on the surface. So do you, do you have an example of one or you want me to give one? Well, I, 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 I'll, give I'll, me one. I'll give you one that I use and tell me if you think it's good or not. Yeah. Uh, so I talk about traffic in Houston or traffic in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And then I ask the question, what's the problem with traffic? Are there too many cars or not enough roads? Right. Is that a paradox? Uh, in a, yeah, I think so. So the, the paradox would be between, uh, I think, kind of capacity and, uh, and, and usage, right? Right. So, so yeah. So, I mean, a, cl a classic paradox is just also the one that bumper sticker is about, safety versus performance. Right. Now, <laughs> I mean, they're interdependent, obviously. You, you, you can't really be safe if you're not working. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and if you're not working, then what's the point of of being, being safe, safe right? right? So they need each other, but they seem to be contradictory with each other. So what do we do with that? I mean, how do you talk about that to a room full of up and coming managers? What, I mean. You know, the thing is that up and coming managers start to see these all the time. The first one. The first one that they see is I got hired because I was such a good individual contributor and all of the strengths that I had that got me hired are the ones that I can't use as a manager. Mm. <laughs> right? Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you bring up more and more of them and depending on where they are, they're, they're like, yeah, they see these all the time. And it's a difference as to whether they see it as a frustration that they can't deal with. Or whether they see it as an opportunity. And that's the big switch, right? Uh, because all of these things like paradoxes, like other kinds of tensions, really, you can think of them as a, um, as a rubber band that's been pulled really tight. You know, it's, it's quaking, it's shaking. You know, you can feel the tension in the room when you have an organization that's in the middle of trying to struggle with one of these things. But really what you have in that rubber band is, is stored kinetic energy. And if you start to deal with it, you can get lots of energy out of the organization. So what people have found by doing case studies is that these tensions are the beginning of creativity. They're the beginning of learning. But it all kind of starts with the pain of having to deal with something that doesn't make any sense and that's really frustrating. I mean, how many times have you heard people talk about, uh, you know, how frustrating management's mixed messages are? Yeah, well, they say we have to do this, but then at the same time we have to do this. So talk about this pain idea because I think the pain idea is a really interesting way um, to sort of encapsulate these theories in an applied way. Yeah. Yeah, I think the pain part's really important. But that's going to freak people out. You know that, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so safety people or organizational people or quality people, because those are the be, be the people that listen to this, those people are going to say, well, well, you know, what the hell do I do with this idea of pain? Even though I think it's profoundly, uh, it's, it's a profound precursor to the potential bigger problems that an organization may have. So talk about right. that. And, yeah, and it's really kind of the beginning of where you can start to get creative and to fix these latent organizational weaknesses before they, before they kill somebody. And so, you know, this, this trend that you've talked to me about 
of uh, you know, zero, zero, not only zero incidents, not even, but just zero near misses, zero right. nicks and cuts. <laughs> I mean, that strikes me as insane it's because crazy. it's crazy because all you're doing is avoiding very manageable pain that's going to give you really good information uh, and just waiting for it, and just waiting until things get bad enough that you have the major pain that takes a huge organizational overhaul to deal with. So if you're going to talk about pain with a leader, with, with a, a, a leader, I mm-hmm. guess as good a place as any, how would you start that conversation? Well, usually what I do is I ask somebody who is an athlete in the room. And, you know, there's always somebody who's a marathon runner or, or you know, uh, played uh, competitive uh, you know, croquet or something. And, uh, and you ask them, well, if you're a marathon runner and you feel pain in your ankle when you're running, what does that mean to you? And they say, well, it means that I need to really start making some decisions. I need to analyze what's going on. Is it the kind of pain that means I need to stop now and address or my running career is over? Is it the sort of pain that means I have to change my stride a bit, um, that I need to go and get it attended to, it just you know wrap myself up, and I can continue the race with further monitoring? But basically what it does is it focuses their attention and it makes them realize that they have to be making some decisions pretty soon. Right? They're problem solving and then they're making decisions. But that's a remarkably unique way to look at this problem. I right. Mean, that's, that's, it's, it's brilliant. And it's brilliant because it allows you to use something you know pain of activity, pain of getting older, pain, pain, pain. Now, so Freud talks about pain, right? And I think that it's applicable. Siggy. I know, Siggy! Siggy. <laughs> uh, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar talk. Sometimes. Sometimes. But sometimes it's not. <laughs> all right. Well, so he talks about the pleasure principle. All human, all human behavior can be described by people either avoiding pain or seeking pleasure, right? Um, and so this avoidance of pain is, is a pretty natural response. But within Freudian psychology, the avoidance of pain is – a a defense ne- mechanism, especially when it's unconscious, right? And that unconscious avoidance of pain also means that you avoid understanding the problem that the pain is a symptom of. So in a way, you're talking about how organizations sort of collectively neglect, right? Mm-hmm. What is it we're not going to pay attention to in this meeting today? Right. And if you look at that in a Freudian frame, what we're learning is that's the organization sort of denying there's a problem in order to create a situation where they don't have to solve a problem they don't want to have. Fair enough? Exactly. Okay, gotcha. Exactly. So what we need to do is move beyond Freud to the positive psychologists. And, and they started talking about something called coping, right? Coping is when you're consciously dealing with the pain, right? So you know that there's pain. It's not the subconscious avoidance. There is sort of a conscious trying to mitigate that pain. And so that's when you get more into problem solving in this coping space. And so you open yourself up to understand the pain. But even better, (laughs) uh, some say, especially when it comes to paradoxes, is acceptance, is sort of welcoming the pain at a certain level, right? And saying, I'm so glad I stubbed my toe in this situation because this has told me about this problem that's happening within my organization. So you kind of start seeking out, looking for these arrows, these indications where there's pain and, and you're, you're proactively trying to be creative problem solve, uh, you know, trying to innovate based on these little pain points that you're almost looking for. And these pain points are more than just a near miss Mm -hmm. or a first date or a close call. They're pressure points somehow in the system, like in the production system, where doing the work is now more difficult Mm -hmm. because it's more difficult. That's a pain spot for them. Fair enough? Right. And frustration. I think we can't forget the emotional element of work and just finding where workers are complaining and being frustrated and making fun um, is a place that you should be looking for. 
do we see those? And how do we well, look yeah. for them? How do we, how do we find them? What's, well, what's your theory on that? Uh, you know, well, one of the things I think because I, I'm, I focus on managers is that managers need to actually be present. I mean, you've talked about this all the time, and we've heard this for years and years, management by walking around. But it's not – I think the way that we conceptualized it years ago was that when managers are around, then workers are more conscious, Right? Right. right. <laughs> but I think about it now a little bit differently. A manager's job is to show up and be present and to observe, to ask questions, to actively try and understand oh, the worker's environment. But if you use your pain metaphor, and I completely agree with you, then the manager really needs to understand where the pain is mm -hmm. and help diagnose and treat really that pain using more of an epidemiological sort of framework yeah. to get better. How, how would managers do that? How do they find where those pain points are? I mean, they don't know. Managers look at an organization as an asset to be controlled, mm -hmm. right? Engineers look at an organization as a system that produces a product. Workers look at an, look at an organization as a place where they make money, right? <laughs> where mm -hmm. they, they make their boat payment. They all three have very different perceptions of the same organization, and it's the same organization, right? Yeah. So right. the pain points are going to be, at least in my mind, thinking about it out loud, they're going to be in different places for different roles within the organization. Well, I think that there'll also be places where the the different um, outcomes, you know, you, you mentioned the different outcomes, the, the getting paid, the, you know, bringing the organization forward, the, you know, making sure that the system works, where those start to contradict each other. Right. And so there's where the paradoxes start coming up, where there's a contradiction between the performance that management needs in order for the organization to meet its goals and objectives and what the worker needs to do in order to continue to be able to work and provide for their families and where the system, uh, as it's been conceived, is – is uh, contradictory to any of those other two things. So when you start having conflicts between those different directions, then you know that you're running into some pain points. So, but don't those con conflicts always exist? I don't know if they always exist. I mean, I don't think that they should exist. Uh, if if the if the the system by the systems engineers, um, should be aligned with the organizational's goals and objectives, right? Because right, well, there's right. no point in having a system that doesn't have the efficiencies, margins, production, uh, quality standards that the organization needs in order to be able to sell its product. And the worker, <laughs> uh, there, there shouldn't be a, co a conflict. The organization's performance and its success should be tied to the organization, the, the worker's performance and success. So, I mean, conceptually, they should all be in line. And they never are. But, but no organization is ever perfect. And so looking at where those things contradict seemed to me like the first place to look for areas where you can find some pain points and find some energy for improving. Wow. So that's, that's a lot to think about. That's really, <laughs> but it's really good, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, I mean, and the thing is that we can't, if we use the human analogy again, we use the psychological analogy. Yeah, we can conceive of the perfectly non-neurotic, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, perf perfectly well-adjusted human being, but that human being doesn't exist. Right. And so our our life as human being is all about work and trying to improve ourselves. Well, the same thing with an organization. Organizations are neurotic. Right. And it's a matter of of continuing to work on those areas where we have conflict and neurosis and and dysfunction in order to become better, become enlightened organizations. I like it. <laughs> I like it a lot. All right. I think that's good. I think that's mm. really good. Anything we're missing? Anything we should be reading? Oh, well, let's see. I mean, there's lots of things that that where people are talking about, but um 
You know, I guess it all depends on whether we're looking at the organizational level, the individual level, the interaction level, but we have to constantly be looking at all of those things. This is the thing that all of, and this is the problem in doing research in this area, is that it is complex and there's multiple levels of analysis. So yes, the human level, the individual level is an analogy for the group level, for, for the organizational level, but right. it's not necessarily the same thing. Right. So, you know, we can't make sort of pat assumptions about things. Sounds good. Thanks for your time. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you. This was great. This was fun. All right. Wow. My mind's blown. What'd you think? I'm curious what you're thinking right now. Martha does some amazing things. And one thing she does very well is take these heady concepts and move them down to an applied level by using models and metaphors that I think really are helpful. I think you'll find them helpful as well. It's amazing. And what's amazing is that what Martha talked about was pain. This pain idea is one I want you to think about. In fact, if there's homework on this one, it's think about where your minor pain indicators exist in your system and how you can use those minor pain indicators to be the starting point for analysis. But what I like best about this podcast today is that someone finally said it and now we have it down official. Your organization is neurotic. You've known it. You've always known it. You wanted somebody to tell you and it happened today. That's the podcast. Episode two is in the can. And I think this one's really interesting. Join us for episode three. Martha's coming back. And in episode three, she's going to talk specifically about thinking fast and thinking slow. She's going to call it system one and system two thinking, but I know you'll find this one valuable. Until then, take care of yourself. And as always, this is the Pre-Accident Podcast. Tell your friends, have them join us, have them subscribe. All of that will help us. I'll do these as long as you listen to them. And as always, be safe. Thanks. Thanks. 